I'm an artist. My name is Alice Aycock. When I was a little girl, there were maybe 10 women that did anything anywhere that were in the history books that we knew about. Literally. I don't care whether it was art, medicine, science, you name it. There was hardly any role models. My mother was very concerned about me being not a wife or a mother, but to do something with my life. So I had a great support system. So I went into this feeling that I could do anything I wanted. And I came up against all kinds of obstacles, which I will not bore you with. And I simply refused to acknowledge every time I went to do something that, that those obstacles were there. Because if I had acknowledged it, I would never have gotten out of bed. I grew up in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. I went to Douglas College, which was the women's division of Rutgers University, and then I got a BA and I got a master's at Hunter College in New York City. I was making art, I say, in the closet secretly because it was not a very highly valued activity at that point. I was not going to major in art, and I decided for fun to take three hours of art history and three hours of studio. I walked in to the classroom, and the teacher started to talk about cubism in the context of Freud, in the context of Einstein and the theory of relativity, in the context of World War I and World War II, and that cubism had developed as a compositional system that was trying to uh, sort of mirror the culture, the scientific culture, the literary culture, and, all, and I immediately knew that art could be a great deal more than simply a picture of something that it could actually be the hot zone, the cauldron in which ideas uh, could be played with, dealt with, that it could be really the center of the intellectual universe because of the way this was presented to me. And so I changed my major immediately. Everybody has their singular wound, the thing, the event that marked them, that they're always trying to come to grips with throughout their life. Happiness is its own reward. It's everything else that life throws at you that an artist makes art out of. Some work has been made out of grief, out of loss, out of fear, out of anxiety, out of all those feelings. All the things that happen to you in a lifetime, for me, get translated into my work. It came from a little book I wrote many years ago, and I was being tongue-in-cheek and smart-ass. But when I said some stories are worth repeating, it was my story. I mean, what is a retrospective except repeating your story? And most of this early work here in this room were temporary pieces. They were either built and they lasted for maybe three or four years, or they were ideas that never got built. So I did a piece called Sand Fans, and I was interested in that time in, um, in things that were ephemeral and dealing with pieces that moved and that changed and that um, dealt with time. And I wasn't so interested in permanence. Um, so that early piece where I put a lot, a big pile of sand and put these fans around it, um, was, it's, it was where I begin my history. This one was done at, at um, Art Park in 1976, and um, it lasted for a summer, and it's about having a kind of underground tunnel or labyrinth and then climbing up these walls sort of like an aerial ballet and dead ending in the air and then going back down again. And so I got to learn a lot about sighting and scale and how materials work and how human beings interact with it and all of that and I was really learning with every piece I learned something instead of just being in the studio. I look for ideas everywhere I can. 
language, dance, games, all sorts of things, provide a kind of diagrammatic structure. Wars. Wars as strategies can be extraordinary um, sculptural movements. And then I was also interested in the, in the sort of interrelationship between magic thinking and rational scientific thinking. And I think that relationship between magic and science has been with us since time, since we began. And so I thought, well, I'm going to deal with these machines, but they're not going to function. They're not oil refineries. They're not uh, turbines that power jet engines. They've got to power something else, you know, to come back from the dead or to visit somebody that is long past that you can't find anymore or to capture memories. So this room is filled up with, um, with the machines, and this notion of a kind of turbine wind machine that started with the sand fans goes through a lot of my work, and it's an image that keeps coming up and coming up and coming up. So in each story, there's a city, a thin city, a narrow city. There are different cities with different little generative stories because I kind of liked to write at that time and I liked to make up these little fictions about kings and queens and medieval times and people who loved each other and had affairs and things like that. So this is the king and queen city and mostly the queen lives here and she was a bit of a, she wasn't too nice of a woman actually in my little story. I had this fantasy that I could remember my whole life. And when I was young, I thought I could. I thought I had so many memories that I could remember everything. But I thought I had this wonderful grandmother, and she was, you know, very, very smart, but she was getting slow. And I thought, well, I'll make this drawing for her. And what she will do is she will assign a door to a memory. And then the doors will become streets, and the streets will become years. And what she will be able to do is she will walk through her city of doors, and she will be able to remember all these events. And as she's walking, there are fewer and fewer doors until there's just one or two doors. And what she will get is the story of her life, and then she will get the image of the city of Canton, China, as it was in 18-something or other. Most of the work is not literal. I'm not interested in literal references. But I'm very conscious that I'm manipulating sign systems, and I'm responsible for that. And it isn't just any old meaning. It's a very complex arrangement of things. And usually underlying it, there is something that says, this feels like a little unsettling. I think I did believe that things do have meaning. They just don't have final meaning. I think that I am constantly assailed by meaning, but that that meaning is very transitory and very hard to grasp. Rather than calling it meaning, it's I'm being assailed by a thousand fictions at any moment. I think I did react strongly against the sort of purity of minimal art, but I think I still have a very strong formal core. Sometimes I dislike that in my work and I try to make it less so, um, but it tends to creep up, you know, anyway. So I think that these vortex pieces are about the notion of creativity and where things get stirred up, how things happen, how things, you know, um, get started, the movement, the turbulence that begins something. That's really what they're about. And that underlies so many phenomena. It's not so much just ending up with something that's permanent, that is the final idea. It's more like an idea under construction. If it's symmetrical, you know, I try to undercut it in whatever way I can. Because symmetry says solid, everything's okay, everything's harmonious, everything is, you know, this is the way everything is going to be. It always has been this way. I try to counter it with asymmetry. Asymmetry is cubism. 
Asymmetry is Russian constructivism. Asymmetry is the world is not solid, it's not secure, it's precarious. And it's about outer space. All this work that I did in all these different places across America, where I made some very large scale, huge sculpture, basically gave me the expertise and the experience to pull Park Avenue off. And not only to do it from a practical, technical point of view, but to also understand what it took to take that site on and engage the architecture and engage the avenue. And of course, I lived in the city all these years, so I knew that site very well. So we could uh, design in the computer and look at it from every point of view and change things and pivot things and change heights and do all sorts of it in terms of what's that building like over there? What's, what do you see from the left lane you know, when you're stopped at the light at 53rd? Now, people ask me all the time, do you do these things yourself? Well, what do you think? Of course not. I have earth-moving equipment, and I have engineers, and I have help. All of these things are carried out by teams of people who are able to turn my finger motions in, into reality. While I am the boss, if things go wrong, I'm responsible. But there is a huge team of very dedicated people. They work really hard. So I have to give credit to all of that expertise of real people who are very, very responsible and very dedicated to this cause. And I think that the pieces are both celebratory, the way fireworks are celebratory, and they're also underlyingly about a certain kind of turbulence and instability that, um, yeah, after all, we've come through 9-11, we've come through Sandy. I mean, I know how wonderful and exciting and in a moment anything can change in this city. So it's about all of that, not just the beauty part, but all the other stuff. I think that right now we still do not know what it means to be human, let alone what it means, what part of the brain is the female brain and what part of the brain is the male brain. We know what our personal experiences are and how, you know, and we, but we have no idea yet about all the other things. And part of it is a wonderful discovery. Being an artist is having a conversation with yourself and constantly discovering parts of yourself that you didn't know was there. So that's why I don't like to pigeonhole things and say, well, this is me being more gentle and female, and this is me being more aggressive and male, or whatever, because to me it's just all one big stew pot of what I want to do next. But that said, you have to have tunnel vision, whether you're a man, a woman, whatever your background is, if you constantly look at all the reasons why somebody will not let you do something, you will not do it. And you have to entitle yourself and believe that you can do it and then just try your best. I think art can reflect, it can mirror its time, it can mirror the period it's in. I think the best art opens things up, it asks questions, it does not give answers. And that's what's so wonderful about that. What is the answer? And she says, what is the question?